My name is Marcia Eli. I am the uh, director of programs here. I put together these public events. And um, as you all know, this Saturday, October 29th, marks the 10th anniversary of when Hurricane Sandy slammed into our region. Tonight, we're gonna reflect on where we are this decade later, what has been done, what hasn't been done, and where we go from here. I wanna thank Pratt Graduate Center for Planning and the Environment for your partnership in this program. In a moment, we will hear from a distinguished panel of experts, and you have their bios, um, which you were given when you came in. Uh, you can read their bios, and um, that way I don't have to spend a lot of time when they could be talking telling you who they are. Uh, but first, it's my pleasure to introduce Larry Rassiopo, who brings a unique and personal perspective to Superstorm Sandy. Larry is a photographer who lives in Far Rockaway, and he documented Sandy from the perspective of a resident. His photographs became the project Larry's Sandy Diary. A version of that was displayed in 2013 at the Museum of the City of New York. Uh, and its latest iteration is on view at RISE in Far Rockaway, which stands for the Rockaway Initiative for Sustainability and Equity. Um, if you wanna look through Larry's book of the exhibit, it's a $10 purchase at the back of the table. Um, but right now, please help me welcome Larry Rassiopo. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. And I want to uh, tell you about the show. First, let me get a picture up. I live on the end of Beach 130th Street, and we were hit very hard by Hurricane Sandy. And to understand Hurricane Sandy, at least in Rockaway, was that the year before there was Hurricane Irene. And we were told to evacuate, it's gonna be a big disaster, and nothing happened. And so when they came around, the trucks came around with the loudspeaker saying evacuate Hurricane Sandy, everyone was like, oh yeah, chicken little, nothing's gonna happen. And then the rain started coming in and it became really frightening. The first picture is my symbol of the, what happened in Rockwood is volunteers came from all over the city and all over the country. And they helped restore Rockaway. People would knock on your door and say, Closer, okay, and say, what can I do to help? What can I, what can I bring you? What can I get for you? And um, I'm gonna take this for a second. And um, the biggest thing was, we heard about this, my children live in Brooklyn, they, they said, they said, come and stay with us. And we said, nah, nothing's gonna happen. And then the rain started really getting harder. And then our basement windows burst and the basement started filling up with water. And I went down the basement stairs and saw that the water was already over the outlets. So I stood on the stairs and with a the, with the mop stick, closed the two big breakers. And then about 10 minutes later, I saw all the lights in Rockaway went out. And we, d we had no place to go, so we just hung around a little bit, had an early dinner and went to bed. We went to our upstairs bedroom, our guest bedroom. And about nine o'clock, I went out to walk my dog and this was the street right outside my house. And this is the ocean wall at Beach 130th Street. And by this time we were scared. And we didn't really know what to do. But so we went to bed. And I got up in the morning about 7.30. The house was still standing, nothing happened to us. So I went out on my front deck and I looked east and then I look west, and here's the uh, beach wall. So I live in a, uh, a row of houses that are back from the sand. There are six houses right on the sand, and I'm in a row of six houses. So we were kind of spared the worst. So I went downstairs and saw my living room was okay, nothing happened. I opened the door to the basement, and this was the watermark. You can see the stairs in the upper left. And this was a furniture floating, that white object in the back is my dryer. And this is what we experienced. So I told my wife things were okay. This wasn't gonna hurt us, but it was gonna be, cost us. Then I went outside and looked east. This was the front of my house. I'm one house in from that bush. And that's 129th Street. My neighbors, my neighbors were already out looking at things. Then I walked um, 
west to the beach wall. This is that same entrance to the beach. The night before, people were putting plywood and sandbags up against the, the uh, beach wall. And these little chunks of the sidewalk floating. And that piece is the boardwalk from about 125th Street came down this far. Then I looked up the block, going towards the bay. And this is all pieces of the sidewalk floating. And past was my neighbor's house. And there had been a garage attached that was made into a studio apartment. And the person who lived there was going to stay. And at the last minute, he decided to leave. And I think that's why he was alive. This would have killed him. And these are the houses right in front. People coming around now about 8, 9 o'clock in the morning, people walking around, taking a look at things, taking, taking photos. This was our basement as, as the water receded. So eventually the water went down to about three feet. And what's interesting about this photograph is a week or two after Sandy, I got an email from the New York Foundation of the Arts saying that the Warhol Foundation had contacted them and they wanted to give grants to artists who were impacted by Sandy. And unlike dealing with FEMA and Build It Back, which took quite a while to get paid, uh, NIFA said, send us one photograph and a link to your website. Three days later, I got a phone call. We're giving you $5,000 to help you rebuild. Four or five days later, the check came. And my wife, who is a construction manager and, and, and much smarter than I am, dealt with the city. But nothing was as easy as this. And I felt that the city had the attitude, you have to prove that you need something. And NIFA was the opposite. You say you need something, we'll give it to you. And if you tricked us or ripped us off, we'll, we'll live with it. It was a very different experience. This is looking back towards the back of the house. You can see the window where everything came in. And eventually, all this had to be removed. So this is my wife and our contractor assessing the damage the next day. The first thing was to get a generator. And then we had to get gas. If there was a gas crisis at that time, you might remember. And we had to get hoses, that blue hose. We had to get three lengths to get to the street. And it began this slow process of pumping out the house. This is the one window where things were. And once you got the water out, you had to deal with three feet of sand. And it was shoveling it into a bucket, taking the bucket to the window, passing the bucket out, putting the sand into a wheelbarrow, bringing it to the street. This was a, a crew of um, Slovenian workers that worked for contract that my wife knew. They were incredible how hard they worked. It was, it was just endless. And as I say in my original um, book, we were lucky, we only lost stuff. Several people, as you know, died. And it just cost us some things, but we were able to replace them. And what's interesting is every single house was doing the same thing. So at some point, you couldn't get down the block. And I lost, uh, in addition to some artwork, most of my photography equipment and photographs and negatives were on the top floor, so they weren't damaged. But I lost a lot of personal items, and I had about $6,000 worth of tools from a small wood shop that were not covered. And every day my compound micro box was in this pile and I was so happy that it was covered. It was my, one of my favorite tools, it was $1,000, and I hated seeing it every day. So when they finally took this away, I was really happy. At night, we just had a, a battery powered lantern. better. And they made the plans and worked. And it was, um, in a short while, things got better. So we, because we, it was really ironic that our, our dryer had, a, had a, it was a gas dryer, and it had a 20-foot flexible hose, so the line never broke. The first utility it was at was a gas company, and they said, is the water in your basement bubbling? And if you said no, you could use the stove. So we were able to cook small meals on the uh, stovetop, and I started looking around the neighborhood. So I, my house is in that row of houses past the flag, and I started seeing neighbors' houses, and I 
didn't really feel comfortable taking photographs. I, I thought it was kind of ghoulish. So I took a few photographs and central to this is I had a young dog that had to be walked several times a day. So I would just walk the dog and I started taking cell phone photos. And, and, and this is one that I like. And in, in the show in, in Rockaway, someone came to the show and said, that's my boiler. That they, it, this was 134th Street. And this was a restaurant that's now been restored that was a real neighborhood center. Every first communion, every confirmation that fit, people had their parties here. And this to me is one of the symbols of one of the burned houses. A few blocks from my house is the most unlucky square block in the city. It's where Flight 587 crashed. And now they had, fought, they had these big fires. So this, a lot of this had to be rebuilt. And this fireman is in front of a house all cleaned up today. And this is the beginning of my walks. You had to come up here, show your ID. You would get uh, 10 gallons of gas, which was enough to run the generator for a day. So this was part of my routine. I had a little wagon and my dog and the canisters. And on the way, on the way back to the church, on the way back to the house, rather, this is Beach 129, I passed a church. And this is a Catholic church called St. Francis de Sales. And it was amazing that by November 2nd, they had these food lines. And across the street was the, the church school parking lot. They erected a giant tent that served meals. And how they got this together so fast really amazed me. And people came not just from Rockaway is funny. This neighborhood is called Bell Harbor or Rockaway Park. The Pond City is to the west, far, far Rockaway is to the east. People came from all over. They got food, shelter. And, and they turned the gym into a giant clothing and uh, food dispensary. You could come in and say, I needed stuff. And no one ever asked. No one ever said, you're taking too much or you can only have two pairs of socks. You took what you needed and walked out. The church was giving out tetanus shots. They had a mobile health thing set up. And this is one of my favorite pictures. And I also took, I had no idea why I took, I took a gallon of bleach just in case. It seemed like that's something you wanted to have. Then I started photographing. I still felt I didn't want to photograph everywhere. I didn't go to Breezy Point, which was a real mecca for photographers. So I just photographed the people right on my block around the corner from my house. It was one of my neighbors, and the woman was an amateur painter, and all her paintings were in the basement. So she threw them out. And then people started throwing out everything that was in their basements. And some houses on this block didn't have a basement, so they lost everything on their first floor, all their furniture, all their living room things. And then people started throwing out all these different objects. And I was drawn to like the iconography that I grew up with, Christmas and Catholic Church. Someone's wall was down. This, this was appeared in a few newspapers. This photograph of Babe Ruth. This isn't someone's uh, dumpster. This is a family photo. There was all these things everywhere. And this gentleman lived a block away, and he built this dollhouse for his daughter. And by the time of Sandy, his granddaughter was playing with it. But it was all funky and moldy, and he had to throw it out. So one of the things I photographed over time, starting in, 20, in 2012, was the beach wall. So I'd come out of my house and just look at the ocean. And in, in the exhibit is a series of 14 photographs, but I only put a few here. So people would come, and sometimes there was better uh, internet re phone reception here than closer to the bay. And little by little, the city started working. They started blocking it off. And they built these walls, which were really amazing, out of steel. And there was this endless pounding. But these are kind of like a half I-beam, if you look closely. And now when there's a storm, the city drops in a metal gate at the end of each block. And it's, it's really great, and you feel protected, but so far there's never been a need for them. The water's never come over the dunes, and then sometimes it's there for two or three days. If you want to go on the beach, you have to climb over it, which has caused some uh, annoyance. And at night, it was like close, encount close encounters of the third kind. There was machinery, lights, noise. You never knew exactly what was being done. And I would go out, set up my tripod, take a few pictures, just intermittently, never intending really to publish or exhibit it. And another thing about Rockaway is no matter what, people can go to the beach. So they climb over, walk by, and just go down to use the ocean because it's so beautiful. People, people were swimming today. 
And on the other side of these walls, uh, build it back, put these, or the city put these bags, they're called trap bags, and there's a space of about two feet. And people use them to play on. And this has become a public bathroom between the wall and the, the trap bags. This is 4th of July in 2013, so already people are back up and running. And this is how the beach wall looks uh, this summer. Kids come down by bikes and they walk over. But the city built these dunes which is, uh, and planted grasses. And it's one of the best things. It's kind of beautiful. And this is a view, and when you come down, you can see why it's protected. And almost everyone has, has built their house back that I know. There may be two or three vacant lots in all of Bell Harbor and uh, the Ponset. So I'm going back to some of the first pictures. This is the house that was really wrecked. They got the most volunteers of any of, any of the houses I saw. And this is how it looks today. So I couldn't get quite the same angle. This is the house next to me. Three days later, these volunteers came. And you had to dig out all the sand to get to the walkway. And this was the house that summer, 2013 also. The house on the right that's been vacant is still being worked on. But there's a group of 12 houses. 11 have been restored really nicely. These were the houses in front. This is how they look now, and, and that's the house that's still being worked on on the left. This was the wrecked house, and this was that summer. They restored it, and it's very different now. They, they made it very different. And there's a swimming pool here now and a garden where that rubble is. The fireman was moved and is now part of this new house. And it was odd doing those before and after because I spent 20 years doing them for HPD. And one of my last few years working at HPD, we started, HPD started building in Far Rockaway in Arverne. And this was the first phase in, in 2007. And it's going like Sherman's March to the Sea, heading for the, for the Atlantic Bridge. And it's right on the boardwalk. And this is something for the panel to discuss, is how good an idea is this? It's building and building and building right on this coastline. People are very happy with the housing to the best of my knowledge, but a lot of people wonder, are we prepared for the next, the next event? And I don't know if any of you remember The Blob, the movie with Steve McQueen, where they take The Blob, this like kind of monster that's eating people, and they freeze it and they bring it to the North Pole. And the sheriff of the town says to Stephen Queen, we can't kill it, but we froze it. And a very young teenage Stephen Queen says, yeah, that's good, I guess, as long as the North Pole stays cold. And the movie credits come up, and it changes from the end to this. And I this is where I'd like to leave it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Larry. Thank you so much. Um, now, please help me welcome Thad Pulowski, Ron Schiffman, Ellen Nisus, and Eddie Batista. Come on up. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Can you, you hear might? me? Okay. Terrific. So we have about an hour um, to uh, make this interesting for people. <laughs> maybe, maybe a good place to start is, I think what's really interesting about this panel, um, I think some of you know this crew, but if you don't, um, a lot of times panels are full of engineers and kind of resilience pros who look at things from the perspective of their discipline. And I think what's really interesting about this panel is that um, they think about the whole city, whole communities, and how resilience relates to so many other issues in the city. So I think it's going to be a, a different conversation than I, than I hear a lot at work. Um, Maybe just the litmus test kind of temperature 
five words, how well have we done since in these 10 years? And then we'll, we'll go from there. Can I say something before? Of course. Uh, I just want to acknowledge the, the photographs and Larry's presentation because I thought it was really moving. Uh, I had the opportunity right after Superstorm Sandy when the Office of Emergency Management asked Deborah Gans and myself to come in and sit with them, uh, primarily so that we could free them up to do what they had to do. So I became a tour guide and I had the opportunity to go to the Rockaways right after Superstorm Sandy with Judith Enk from the EPA, with Maddie Stanislas from the Environmental Protection Administration, and with uh, a guy by, with a group eventually called the National Disaster Preparedness Center out of Hawaii, mm -hmm. and spent a lot of time taking them around. And the impact of just seeing that, those photographs again, uh, and, and and the misery that it, uh, uh, it was just overwhelming. The parking lot for Reese Park, for the beach, at Jacob Reese Park at the very end, yeah, yeah. was filled, I would say, almost two thirds of them with sand and debris that were collected from all of the houses that were there. I have photographs on my phone, but I can't project it here. But it, it was just overwhelming. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge that what Larry did and his work, uh, I remember the show, by the way, at the Queens Museum with Rise, which is a group that uh, David Burney and I and a number of others have been working with right from the very beginning, Eve Barron. Uh, and so, because this is a family crowd that's here in many ways. Uh, and uh, it really was, I think, it tells a story that we have forgotten. And I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, well, I, I thought those photos were a great way to start, and thanks so much for sharing those. I, I was just thinking about the solemnness of this occasion, you know, 10 years later, and how much loss there was um, during Hurricane Sandy, and, but how much loss there's been in the intervening years, too. I, not, I mean, not terribly, um, I won't say I'm pessimistic, but I see a lot of loss all around us, um, the climate crisis has gotten worse. Our communities are less um, prepared to, to deal with what's ahead. Um, our government is fractured, fragmented, you know, failing. Um, and our, you know, trust between people and government is really low. Um, so yeah, I feel like we're, we're, we're losing social cohesion. We're losing social mobility um, we're, we're losing our capacity to deal with climate change. I don't want to be so negative, but, you know, just looking at those photos just made me think, you know, people were living in this neighborhood and having good lives, right? And um, it's harder now, right? I don't know if that's the way you feel, Larry, but um, it's it, in a way the loss is, you know, just very real and compounding. Yeah, I mean, it's it's I, 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 I can't be a pessimist because, you know, then the funders want their money back. Like, I can't. <laughs> I'm, I'm, what I am is a cynical optimist. Like I, I've, I've seen um, New Yorkers uh, really kind of roll their sleeves up. Uh, and and there have been a number of uh, really significant policy victories in the last 10 years. But the fights that it took to get these pieces of legislation should not have happened, right? Um, and we've lost years. Yeah, I'll just give you two examples. Like two of the, the more compelling pieces of policy um, uh, legislation that we got passed, um, let's just take at the city level. If we look at the greenhouse gas emissions that are generated in New York City, 70% or so are from the built environment, from the buildings, right? Um, and close to 30%, the remainder, most of it is transportation. So there were two laws that we were trying to get passed in the late 2000s, right? It was the Greater Greener Buildings mm -hmm. Plan. It was uh, a plan that would uh, go after buildings that were 50,000 square feet and above and man you know, mandate that they, um, that they do a, a uh, you know, uh, an assessment 
of their building's energy envelope and and a mandate that they have to actually you know bring their their buildings up to you know to at least reduce their greenhouse gas emissions like a real mandate and uh, i remember at the time i was i was at city hall and we you know it wasn't the it wasn't the out of touch billionaire that blinked it was the city council the city council uh, got a lot of pressure from the association, whatever the co-op, and those of you who live in co-ops may know what I'm talking about, there's a cooperative uh, lobby in, in New York City, and um, they went nuts in Queens, and they fought back, and we we lost 10 years, mm. because it wasn't until 2019 that we finally got something called the Local Law, Local Law 97, or the Climate Mobilization Act passed. 10 years of emissions that we could have, you know, started grappling with at the in the early teens. Congestion pricing. Congestion pricing was the other leg that we tried to get past in the late aughts. And, you know, and we all know what happens with good ideas. It goes to Albany to die, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, Shelley Silver, then speaker, didn't even let the bill come out for a vote because the assembly members didn't want to get primaried by the city. It's just so like we lost another 10 years, then, right? Um, and, you know, and, and the hits keep on coming, right? Like we... Did anyone in their wildest imagination think that there would be a time when there would be not a storm surge, heavy rain drowning literally a couple of dozen New Yorkers mm. in their basements, right? So yeah, it's 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 kind of hard to look at this moment and and be you know wildly optimistic, but uh, I also know I've seen the I've seen the the progress I've seen whether it's getting kind of you know New York State to pass. Uh, the, the most ambitious climate law among the 50 states, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, or Congestion Pricing, or the Climate Mobilization Act. Uh, but that's just, that's the mitigation part of it, right? We're still on, on adaptation. You have, uh, you know, and, and what's really kind of, to me, heartening is the very communities that are disproportionately vulnerable to climate change, low-income communities and communities of color. Some of the most visionary climate leadership are coming from these communities, right? Like, we're going to have the largest offshore wind assembly in the United States on the Brooklyn waterfront where my father was a longshoreman and never thought that jobs would be coming back. You know, actual manufacturing or, or, or working class jobs. Uh, and we're talking about, you know, a few thousand jobs that that'll generate, um, you know, to the point in the South Bronx. And they have something called a Be A Buddy program where they have the issue of social cohesion and resiliency. They've organized their neighborhood. So every block has like captains that is, would look out for their neighbors in the event of a severe weather event, right? All of this, and we haven't even started seeing the worst of it. The worst is the heat. Mm -hmm. we've, not, we've not dealt with the heat waves and the deaths that we can expect from that. But it doesn't mean that we, a lot of us aren't pushing at, at all levels, you know, city, state, and federal. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll see where we are in a couple of weeks at the federal level, but uh, and maybe even at the state level, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, it hasn't, I, I, what I would say is that uh, the activist community has taken this moment you know, tremendously serious. And we have some partners in the legislature we could work with. But when every decision is about the next election mm -hmm. and would, would we need to be talking about 50 to 100 plus years of like, that's the kind of thinking that we need as we build out a more resilient, adaptable city, you know, try selling that to the city council when they're, you know, they're just worried about the next election. So it's, 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 uh, it's, it's beyond challenging. Uh, I will say that, you know, I mean, the activists and the folks that are committed to this work have made tremendous progress, but man, there's so much more to go. That's why I came tonight, by the way, like to hear the long view. Thank you, Eddie. It's actually, I'm feeling better, you know. <laughs> I think you should have felt better by seeing the work that the community and, and the Rockaways did in rebuilding without having access to the resources and the ability uh, to garner a lot of the legislative framework. What scares me, though, is what the, how long will that improvement last? Uh, and the question mark of the last photograph, when you're looking out at the water, I think was a very telling one. Uh, the one of all of the new housing that's being built in the Rockaways, should we be building there? Should we be building there? When some of the engineers and designers working on that project turn to you and say, well, it'll last at least one or two mortgage cycles. That's 40 to 60 years. 
That, that's dangerous because then when you talk about managed retreat, when you talk about uh, buyouts, all of a sudden, uh, all of the racist policies that led to the displacement of people uh, will, will rear their heads in an area where people may have to be displaced because they're in harm's way. Mm -hmm. And how do we, we, all of our programs are geared primarily to homeowners, but better, what about the people who live in public housing and the renters? How are we going to replace, you know, the 20,000 units of housing that are located on, on that peninsula that may be for, in harm's way? Uh, we can't build low-income housing in five years. We can't build it in 30 years. Mm -hmm. And so we really have to start addressing this issue uh, in, from a long view. Yes, what the communities have done and demonstrated their resilience and the environmental justice community has led the way has been terrific. And, uh, but at the same time, they don't have the bandwidth, and I'm quoting somebody, mm -hmm to deal with the issues sometimes where they need to be at the table. Like, how do we really plan in a way that we don't put more people in jeopardy? Yeah. Seems like money could solve that problem to some extent. Um, you know, the, the people who are uh, employed in the, the uh, resilience work are rarely the community leaders who groups that belong to NIJA um, and, and others. Are there other positives that we should talk about? Larry gave us the dunes and uh, all of this, uh, you know, self, self building and you gave us some great policy examples and some actions in, in communities. Are there actionable plans that communities have developed that we could act on? Are there other positives that you see? Well, I'm in the education space, so I, I do find that um, you know, we're starting a climate school at Columbia, which is a new thing. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's causing us to, like, think about our institutional position in the city and how, like, you know, institutions of higher learning, especially particularly evil ones like Columbia, unlike Pratt, which does a lot of good work in the world over, <laughs> over time, uh, you know, start to help frontline communities address the climate crisis. So we, we're starting from scratch, basically. And I think that's, you know, that's a, a hopeful place in a way. I think it's being very much driven by like young people. I feel like working with young people all the time, I see this ethical clarity in the way that they approach the climate crisis that my generation hasn't caught up with, you know, that this is wrong, that like a kid being born in one neighborhood versus another has different health outcomes. That's wrong. Like that's not the society that we want to live in. And, and so, um, and then, you know, for us, Ellen, you, you and I are like sort of resilience practitioners, right? Like we're in the, the community of practitioners of resilient, you know, as designers, um, and planners. Um, I feel like we've had an evolution in the last 10 years, you know, learning from Eddie and, and, and others to, to stop focusing so much on, you know, our, the opportunity of disaster, you know, like making things better, but really joining the struggle and stopping to talk about resilience so much. I run a center for resilient cities and landscapes, but uh, funders and, um, and to start talking about justice, you know, to start talking about climate justice as an evolution of, of, of environmental justice. So I think that's a positive evol evolution that we're learning institutionally. Um, and I think our government is learning too. I feel like one, you know, I'm, I'm worried about our government I, I, because they're underfunded, you know, and we need to just like figure out how to get more capacity in government. But I did want to go back to this issue of like bandwidth for EJ communities or community leaders um, uh, because, you know, something that came out of the White House, this Justice 40 initiative that's saying like, we're going to put 40% of all infrastructure dollars into disadvantaged communities. Seems like a great thing, but we know these projects need to be led by communities. And that's a lot to put on Nija and all the other, you know, EJ leaders around the city. So I wanted to ask you, you know, cause I say this all the time and I've said that Ron and I have had this conversation in the past that like, you know, the way we did East side coastal resiliency, total disaster, you know, like every, every big infrastructure project has just been a disaster. The public housing retrofit and Red Hook government doesn't do any of this stuff. Right. So like, is there a future where 
we just take $52 billion from the Army Corps of Engineers and split it up into 50 chunks and give it a billion dollars to Nija, a billion dollars to, like, would that work? <laughs> it would work for moi. I, 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 it, 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 since it won't happen, but I, I, sugar plum fairies are dancing right now. Um, yeah, I mean, look, it's... it's um, it's interesting you mentioned Justice 40, right? Because the Justice 40 initiative is directly, it's, it, it is, it is, a, it is a, 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 an active federal program that completely is based on what we did in New York. Like when Biden was running, he, when he put out his climate agenda, which included Justice 40, candidate Biden said, hey, I'm, I'm picking up from what New York did. Right. So like, for example, this is the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, the CLCPA. Right. So uh, in in the in the climate lead, in the state state climate law, we mandated that 35 to 40 percent of all clean energy funding has to be directed to frontline uh, or dis disadvantaged communities. And that is what Justice 40 is. Now, the great irony is because the federal government, the Supreme Court and all the forces that we know that are at play right now, because of that, Justice 40 cannot use race as an indicator. Like you cannot steer the money, but you can't use racial classification, right? Now, how one deals with environmental racism without taking race into account, there's a policy disconnect there, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's, that's, the, that's a major flaw. And for us, what's really interesting is that when we started doing our organizing, we launched a, a statewide coalition called New York Renews uh, at the end of 2015. And at that time, we expected the 2016 election that there would be a continuation of democratic control of the White House and Congress. And we were like, okay, there's gonna be some relief coming from that end, but we can't let our state and city off the hook. We have to like organize and make sure that we're stepping up. And then after the election, we were like, local activism is the only game in town. That's, that's the only way we're gonna get anything done. And so in some ways for us, it's not, I think, a coincidence that some of the most visionary climate policy work that's happened has happened either like in a New York or California or whatever, and it's happening because folks at the grassroots finally said, we can't wait on the federal government to get this thing done. But the federal money would be nice. <laughs> yeah. You know, almost every major federal program that led even to the development in the during the New Deal came because of either workplace organizing or community organizing. And we have to recognize that. But I'd like to differ a bit with you. I think government can do things. And I think we have to put it back into the position where it has to do things and has to succeed. Mm -hmm. uh, we built some of the highways where we shouldn't have built them, but we built them. All right. We uh, yeah. did uh, right after Superstorm Sandy, those lifeguard uh, uh, pods that landed in the Rockaways came because David Burney and the city of New York actually designed and planned those. The city actually planned, and you were part of that, and wrote a, a, a great report called before the, uh, after the storm, but they wrote it before the storm. They wrote it before Superstorm Sandy. And in it were proposals of what do you do when you have to ha rehouse tens of thousands of people if there was a major storm in New York City, if there was a major catastrophe, when you had to immediately have all those units of housing. So they came up with a model that was built and uh, that was erected in, in right across Cadman Plaza, not too far from where we're sitting right now. And that model, was how you can build industrialized housing where you contract out to various different builders or contracting companies in the region. And if you need it, they all have the plans and they can within weeks begin to produce the units and you can assemble them on site. Well, you know, it's not a climate emergency, but we have an immigration emergency. Mm -hmm. uh, we could have put up on vacant lots and in parking lots, and in different places, tens of thousands of units to meet the Venezuelan influx into New York City. It's a housing crisis, mm -hmm. and part of the climate crisis is also a housing crisis. We have to get back to taking some of the stuff that comes out of government and actually put it back into production and to really begin to vote the people into office that will execute these plans. And we can't join those naysayers 
We have to force government to do a better job. One of the things that Larry photographed was something uh, called the uh, vacant cluster housing in New York, where the city built how many units of housing? within a short period of time, when they rehabilitated in Harlem and in the Bronx, thousands of units of housing. Mm -hmm. And the photographs he took of that process are amazing as well as th these. And we have to think about th thinking big for a change and that we have to partner with government to do it. And, and I'm, I'm fearful the way the rest of you are, and I hope the rest of you are fearful, that we may have a fascist government six mm -hmm. months from now, yeah. two, six weeks from now, two weeks from now. We have to be in a position of how we preserve our democracy, how we make our democracy, which is imperfect, a more perfect one and a more functional one. And that's got to be our role as well. Mm. Yeah. Ron or others, are there, are there examples of cities that are doing a better job of these kind of infrastructure projects? I, yeah, I, um, I, I don't think so, um, but I'm not sure. I mean, you know, obviously, it's there's. I've been part of these whole city to city exchange networks through the Rockefeller Foundation, like 100 resilient cities, and there is something sort of uh, neo colonial about the city to city exchange. Um, the success examples are usually, you know, like about, you know, like what we call now petrochemical urbanization, like basically the machine of growth spreading across the globe, making everywhere the same. And, uh, and I think what the heartening examples are, um, are the resistance to that, uh, you know, uh, and that's very local, very grassroots. Um, so I think those are the, you know, so when you say our city's doing it well, I think people are doing it well, you know, on a very local level. I, I can't think of like a city administration. You know, there have been spurts of like serious innovation. And I think the Bloomberg era, you know, the out of touch billionaire was like one of those spurts of innovation because they were like the, the city had money, you know, like and it could just hire a lot of good people. And that was great. And people would stick around for more than a few months because, you know, they were getting paid OK. Um, and you know, they, they have flexibility and job growth opportunities. So that, these budget cuts really freak me out. But anyway, I, I think New York City is probably like in terms of like civil service and like, you know, the ability to do these big projects is probably ahead of anybody else because we have great city workers, many of which are in the room right now or have been. I, I want to point out a couple of good examples. One of them is sitting to my left here. Uh, uh, his office is in Sunset Park, and uh, Uprose, which is in Sunset Park, it has something to do with his organization as well. Uh, they're a member of NITO, yeah. They're, they're a member of NITO. <laughs> and Orlando. <laughs> <laughs> and I th there's some connections. But the real issue there has been a fight they had along the waterfront when, where they came with a positive solution to the problem they were trying to address. And out of that came the Green Resilience Industrial District. Uh, I said it right? Yeah. And I think it's really important that we celebrate that. Uh, in, in the Rockaways, we, are, we see a group called the Rockaway Waterfront Alliance morphing into RISE, getting a building, building a consensus, building a connection between various different segments of what was really a very uh, segregated or uh, uh, a divided peninsula. And so they've done tremendous work in trying to unite that effort. In, in uh, Red Hook, you saw the initiation of this READY program, Re research, education, training, and initiative mm -hmm. that has really taken root where you've got young kids from the schools coming in and meeting with professionals and learning about green infrastructure, learning about uh, uh, environmental issues, and they are doing experimentation on how to do floating reefs and other things. It's really an exciting process. These are small but critically important elements because if you take all the small elements together, they can really create a major effort. But we need to support them, and uh, but they're there, and I think 
you know, you've got El Puente in, uh, in Williamsburg. You've got Mothers on the Move in the Bronx. You've got dozens of organizations. We've got to figure out how to catalyze the, and, and build on those efforts. No, I agree. And I, and I think that, uh, listen, I get that, like, I, I get the, 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 frustration about government and wouldn't it be just easier to kind of like just get the money directly out to, mm -hmm. to, to frontline groups. But, uh, but, but yeah, I, I agree with Ron, like it's, it's, we can't let government off the hook. I mean, in terms of just scale and in terms of so many reasons, like government. And in fact, I mean, you know, let, let's call the most basic government function. Uh, let's call them out on it. Like there's no, they keep saying there's nothing more fundamental that government has as a role than to keep its people safe. Mm -hmm. This is it. This is the safety yeah. issue of our lifetime. Like we can talk, you know, about crime in the subways. We could talk about, you know, I still remember 30 years ago, over 2000 people dropping in the streets every year from murder. So like, don't talk to me about like rising crime. Like I remember this town when it was really dangerous. Right. Um, but climate change scares me the way you know, getting uh, beat on the head by a ninja in the subway does it. You know what I mean? So it, it's, um, uh, but I think that the, the issue in terms of community and government partnership, what, what Uprose has been saying a lot lately is like, well, we need to share governance, right? Like, let us do the planning. We're in partnership with government, right? But you all then execute the actual development and deployment of it, right? And, and going back to, to your original point, one of the reasons why I think we were able to get as much done in the teens uh, was building off, in the interest of full disclosure, I, yeah, I worked for Bloomberg, I worked for the Out of Touch Billionaire in the second term, I was Director of City Legislative Affairs, I wasn't there for the third term because that wasn't what I signed up for. But the point was is that Bloomberg believed this stuff in a way that none of the other mayors have. Mm -hmm. he, now, one could say, this goes back to the cynical optimism, like, yeah, you know, one could say that one of the reasons why climate was such a big issue for Bloomberg was because he was still thinking about running for president in 2008. And this was a campaign issue that he was like creating that lane for himself. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, here we are, like, you know, how many however many years later and he's still out there doing climate work. Yeah. Right. So like it, 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 he gets it and it's real for him. De Blasio, God bless him. Great at making announcements. <laughs> <laughs> horrible at implementing them like really bad and 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 it made us crazy because some of those were our own announcements like i remember when they announced zero waste for new york yeah. like we knew there was not gonna be zero waste like, but the fact that it was a goal <laughs> was nice until they cut recycling like the next yeah, budget like it's right. just and 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 with adams they, so I, I think in order for any city to, for this to be real you have to have the chief executive accept this as something of, of a priority. And because the only way this works is it has to be infused throughout government. Like you shouldn't be able to order a cup of coffee in, in city planning without thinking about the, the, the carbon footprint decision. You know, right. Like everything should be, and none of it is. Like how do we end up with tents in the Orchard Beach parking lot, oh my God. right? And and, and, yeah. and literally it had to, like it was a sign from God to throw a little micro burst there that weekend. And that's what convinced <laughs> the mayor. But it shouldn't, it shouldn't have come to that. You're not gonna tell me the city of New York doesn't have city owned property that could accommodate people that doesn't require them having a kayak next to their yeah. bed, right? So it, it, to me, I, I think that uh, the, for us as activists and folks, however we come at the climate work, we need to understand that government is a, a, a reluctant but necessary partner. And that's why politics, I, I, we all hate it, but you can't, it's political malpractice, like they say. We're not figuring out politically how to make, there was a time that climate wasn't a, 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 a tribal partisan issue. Right. Nixon created the EPA, you know what I'm saying? So, the fact that that is still being politicized, well, then again, we never saw COVID and we never saw a pandemic. None of us expected that to be politicized the way it was, right? Um, so a lot, a lot of the changes and charges for us is how do we not make it a partisan issue anymore? You can't, I can't think of a better economic development formula for multiple cities than thinking about how we build out for our adaptation, resiliency, and mitigation needs. Like that's, that's an economic development strategy, which is why, going back to what you were saying, the seven-year fight of Uprose versus Industry City, where they wanted to build, up, they wanted to expand a million extra commercial uh, office space on the Sunset Park waterfront, 
Uprose won that battle. The ULERP was withdrawn by Industry City. The, the then president of Industry City is now the president of the Economic Development Corporation, and they're working with Uprose. So, I mean, it's, you know, you just can't, you can't just, I mean, look, like anybody yeah. else, if I'm in the middle of a seven-year fight, like, I'm going to have some feelings after that, right? <laughs> but, but we can't because we're now in a moment where, like, you know, there's too much. And the thing about, uh, about climate opportunism is 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 you know a, a double edged sword because by the one hand you have never let a good crisis go to waste right uh, but by the same token disaster capitalists and all these other folks that find ways of making money or in in the mo- in the most head scratching turn of events over the last couple of years to have labor make common cause with the fossil fuel industry mm. and to have labor guys out there saying we need natural gas as a bridge. Like, mm-hmm. And these are constituencies that are foregoing their inevitable transition to like yeah. these new green jobs and they're, they're lobbying against it. So it's, it's a really complicated political moment, but there's no, there's no answer to it, but to get through it. But wasn't that issue the one you're talking about people dealing, uh, not dealing with their, best interests at heart. In other words, they, they labor fighting for things that don't benefit them. Isn't that what precipitated the Just Transition Initiative in the state? Well, it's and, really, yeah. and Because uh, I was at a board meeting today of an organization, which I will not name, but it's a very progressive and good one, uh, that deals with racial justice issues. And they were talking about the growth of political violence in the United States and how do we really reach and make connections with labor again? And so I pointed out the Just Transition program that you and others worked in the city. Why don't you talk a little bit about what that is and why we can't use that tool to rebuild the connections with that? What's interesting is the, the concept of a Just Transition actually, there's a debate, but there is a labor part of the debate that says they created that term. Like a just transition is a labor, if you ask uh, labor historians, they'll say, yeah, this came out of the labor movement like in the late 80s. Yeah. I forget which, which, which was the- It was uh, when we were trying to stop nuclear. I think so. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, it, was, it was a nuclear thing, yeah. The problem with, with so, so with just transition, and by the way, going back to, you know, one of our members, Uprose, they have a saying that, you know, that a, just, that a transition is inevitable, but justice is not, right? So in order for the just transition to work, you have to center- uh, racial and, and and income disparities, because if you're not doing that, then again, you're leaving the most vulnerable people behind and you, you're, you're still going to have to pay for people's trauma. There's no, there's no uh, way around it. And it's just that much more cost effective if you plan for that upfront and you do. So the just transition work uh, has been increasingly labor has started to come around. Uh, but part of the problem is that there's a difference between rank and file and the union leadership. Mm-hmm. And the union leadership is in cahoots, some of them with the fossil fuel bosses. And it's not unique to, to climate change. You see it in the hospitals. You saw 1199 with the hospital workers always trying to make something work. 32BJ and Rebney, they try to see if they can make things work. So it's almost a natural uh, reflex. By, and it didn't used to be like that. They, there was a time labor was there to hold the bosses accountable. But now they've pivoted and see their role as being, you know, can we work with the bosses? And the bosses are lying to these folks. They think green hydrogen is, is, is a realistic way out of this. They think renewable natural gas is a way. And all of these are ploys to keep the fossil fuel infrastructure regime going for another few decades. I, I think getting the labor movement involved in adaptation would be really critical for the future too. I mean, with all this highway removal money and the all, you know, the civilian climate corps, you look at what happened in Red Hook with the NYCHA project, you know, where you have these people from all over working on NYCHA housing, like it could have been a huge job workforce development program. And I feel like that this piece is really missing in our, in our very local adaptation efforts. Hunts Point was a great example of, you know, the Teamsters Union, although the, right. the people who are working in the food market uh, ended up being a huge part of the planning process and amazing advocates for this joint plan that even though they were at odds with the companies in the market um, and sometimes allied with the community and sometimes not, depending on the issue, 
by the time the planning process moved to a compromise that had good things for everybody in it, labor was one of the best advocates of, of anyone for the plan. And they still believe in it. You know, they, when the 65 people from Hunts Point, Eddie was there, uh, and uh, from Nija, when busloads of people came from the Bronx, uh, to present the Hunts Point Lifelines Plan to Sean Donovan and the others who were reviewing the Rebuild by Design projects. The labor unions were there, and when Donovan asked, you know, how do I know that you'll invest in this if the federal government puts money into it, the head of the union said, if you put money in, I'll put money in. And he later pledged money from the pension fund uh, you know, as an investment in, in the resilience effort in Hunts Point. And I think that union of interests was produced an amazing plan um, and uh, is, it's still an actionable plan. You know, every few years they try and revive it. Labor tried to get de Blasio to come talk to them about that plan a number of times, but it wasn't the call wasn't answered. But I think that, that, that they still try and revive that plan and get the city and other, other, other levels of government to pay attention to it is, uh, is a good example of what you're saying. What, what's wasn't, that, that, oh, sorry. wasn't that plan just mentioned in Brad Lander's evaluation of the city's climate change, that yeah. only a third of the monies that were granted to that plan have been spent? Well, they were mis misspent, the ones that were okay. uh, spent at all. But um, there was you know, a, a, a process that followed the awarding of the money uh, that was uh, really defeated the community's goals. Yeah. Yeah. So what's next with Hunts Point? What's going to happen to our food supply? <laughs> I think that there are plans like that. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm biased here, but... I think the community leaders, the union leaders, and the market business leaders created an amazing example of a potential public-private partnership with EDC and other government agencies to take collective action. And that, to me, seemed like it's really the only way that this... I, I think government can't do it alone. Um, but you can't do it without government. And that was a really beautiful example of a completely community-led planning process. They were thinking about resilience long before Sandy mm -hmm. and in a really diverse set of ways. And Eddie was the person who kind of called out that neighborhood as this is a neighborhood that's ready to plan because they've been planning for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I do feel like there, that, that plan could be implemented by the new mayor Anytime. And the reason that it's important is had that storm been timed a bit differently, we could have lost our food supply in the city for a number of weeks. Mm -hmm. I think that's the calculation. Maybe it was a number of days, but it was a, a long period of time to curtail the flow of food into the city. And I think it it's incumbent on the city to really take a look at that and move that very fast and very effectively. I mean, there's been, uh, there's been like the, the upshot of that rebuild by design process was uh, at the end of the day of the $50 million, uh, the community had like two choices based on how the, the design thing was going. They could either um, lobby for uh, all of the money to be used for energy resiliency, or they could um, split it between that and coastal resiliency. And that's what the community wanted. They wanted, you know, a chunk of it to go for energy resiliency, meaning the markets, making sure that the markets, uh, you know, are able to, to keep, you know, our food going in, in the event of another, uh, another Sandy. Um, and there's also uh, the need for, like, how do you protect the markets from future storm surges, right? And how do you do so when maximizing green infrastructure, not all gray infrastructure? And at the end of the day, the city decided to put all the money in energy resilience, and of which the community was like, so uh, the lights will be on, but we'll be in five feet of water. Is that mm -hmm. right? And, and that's, it's, it, it just goes to show you that the thinking, there's a disconnect between what sometimes is common sense and what the city thinks is cost effective. And those two, those two things don't always yeah. fit together, yeah. And you know, that 50 million is not enough to do all the things that were in that plan. Yeah. But the 
the potential to, if you have the markets making some investments and the unions making some investments and other levels of government making investments, and you can actually create a credible example of that kind of partnership, that goes a long way to stimulate others. And so I think the, the idea, the Green New Deal, the Just Transition, you know, all, all of these ideas are lifted if we can just create a few examples, in my mind, that are truly community-led um, or community-based in the planning process, uh, because then people would believe that that is actionable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need more good examples for people to point to, for sure, and, and, and to have community advocates for them. I went to a Rebuild by Design Love Fest last night, um, and which is great, you know, like a lot of lessons learned from the whole Rebuild by Design process. And Kate, the co-director of my center, Kate Orff um, at, at Columbia, showed progress report on the living breakwaters. And that happened. They spent, you know, all their money and they had like pretty good community support on Staten Island, but also really deep support from an advocacy community, the Billion Oyster Project. and. I think, and it's a project that inspires people. You know, I think it's really like changed the way that people think about, well, it certainly changed the way DEC thinks about building stuff in the water, like fundamentally changed yeah. how they permit stuff, which is, you know, like a project that kind of changes a regulatory regime. It's pretty huge. But I think it, you know, for a lot of young people that are involved with the Billion Oyster Project, it's sort of changed the way they look at the water. And, um, and you know, it's it, the seals are already living on on the reef, and so, yeah, I, I, we need more happy stories like that for sure. I hope Hunts Point is one soon. Me too. Well, uh, you know, there, there was that plan, and then there's um, kind of again leaning into don't let an opportunity or crisis mm -hmm. pass without trying to make the most of it, right? So, uh, at the beginning of this year, Hochul in her state of the state talked about uh, her desire to electrify the entire Hunts Point market which yeah. is enormous because, so there's something, so I don't know if you guys know this, like 60% of the region's produce and food goes through the Hunts Point markets. Like when Ron said that during Sandy had high tide coincided with uh, Sandy landfall for the Long Island Sound, yeah, our food supply would have been disrupted and nobody knows for how long, right? Yeah. Uh, and if you thought the gas fight, like people were shooting each other over gas, Try try doing that over like you know spam. You know what I'm saying. So anyway, so the the whole thing with with Hunt's it's all point fresh food is, there. There's no spam. Yeah. <laughs> so you have That's these refrigerated crazy. trucks that they call reefer trucks. Now again, I grew up in a different time in New York when I heard reefer trucks. I, like, <laughs> I know they're legalizing them, but by the truck on it. No, these are refrigerated trucks. They have to keep plugged in, uh, and that's constant pollution because that's how you yeah. keep the fruit, the, the, fruit, the produce, and all the food fresh. So Hochul said at the beginning of this year, we're going to electrify the markets. Great. All of a sudden, congestion pricing comes along, which we've been fighting for for, for, for over 15 years, um, and we get a hint months ago that there is there are scenarios under which traffic will increase in the Bronx. And we told the MTA, please don't figure this thing out. Like you can't call this an environmental justice plan and increase truck traffic in the Bronx. MTA, great listeners, roll out the plan with, with the truck, truck in, increases included. And so now we have people in the Bronx saying, we don't want congestion pricing, even though car ownership is lowest in the Bronx, the amount of people that will be charged driving from the Bronx in the central business district is like two or 3%. The vast majority of the Bronx uses obviously trains and buses. And this is an infusion of money that the MTA needs. MTA shot themselves in the foot, but what the community, at least some in the community are doing is they're like, well, you know what? Maybe we can look at the 700 extra trucks a day. That's the worst scenario in the Bronx. Maybe what we could do is look at the emissions associated with those extra trucks, go to the MTA and the Hochul administration and say, you know what, these 50 tons of PM 2.5, these five tons of NOx, you need to find a way to reduce 50 tons of PM 2.5 and 20. In other words, don't be net zero. Don't do an offset. Go deep in your emissions reductions because unfortunately the Bronx is a target rich environment when it comes mm -hmm. to pollution. So that's an example of people that are going to use a, an unrelated policy regimen and try to get at the mitigation that they wouldn't get otherwise. Yeah. How are they going to do that? Deck, 
deck the Cross Bronx Expressway? Or there's a long list of of things that the that the state could do if they so choose. Like we came up with just two pages mm -hmm. of bulleted projects that they could. Mm -hmm. um, we turned it over. We'll see. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we we will. See. There is a debate going on like right now that's going to shape how this and so many mm -hmm. other investments and decisions are going to be affecting us in, in the years to come. So, mm -hmm. go on, go. Yeah. Can the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act do something for New York City? It's done a ton. It's, so there have been already been several pipelines who, whose uh, um, contracts or its permits were canceled because it doesn't comply with the CLCPA. There have been at least three peaker plants that um, one of one of whom got their permit rejected. Another one saw the writing on the wall and decided, I'm going to sell my power plant and, and, change, and to a company that's going to do renewable energy and battery storage. And there's like yet another peaker plant. Like, so CLCP is, is already doing what it was supposed to do. And without the financing, like there's money there, but not based on, on our and, the, and NYSERDA's own estimates. We need about 10 to $15 billion a year for years in order to build out the CLCPA emissions reduction targets that we set mm -hmm. out for ourselves. It yeah. takes money. There's going to be some of that IRA money. Don't get me started on the IRA deal. But between that, the, the, the infrastructure bill, the IL, IILJ, there's money coming that we could put to prop. But this may be, this bigot may be over. And I, who knows what challenges are going to happen if, if Republicans take over Congress. Yeah. yeah. I have a nice student story related to that uh, Newburgh power plant uh, story. Um, so the power plant was approved. They were going to build a new fossil fuel plant where the old one had been damaged by Sandy. Very dirty. Uh, and a community organization uh, in the Hudson Valley, Scenic Hudson, worked with some students uh, from Penn to uh, draw the renewable energy alternative for that site. And uh, we sought out some renewable energy developers to critique the plan and redraw and redraw until it was something that they actually thought was investable. And uh, then the, the community advocates went to meeting after meeting after meeting and got the approval overturned. Wow. And that was just a couple of you know, clever students working with a community-based organization. Are they building the renewable too? Uh, the, the, the renewable consultants who, you know, help them coach them to something that was realistic, uh, they were interested and so were, uh, so were others. So there was a bidding process. And cool. I, I, Unless the crypto guys get to it. You guys oh, have been yeah. following with us. So, so cr cryptocurrency. So there's been at least a couple and more on the way. Shuttered, shuttered power plants upstate that are being reopened only to run the the servers for the crypto mining that yeah oh yeah, yeah it's 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 and there's a bill right now Hochul is sitting on a bill that passed both houses that all it doesn't need it's not even a moratorium it's like slow down and study this before you continue giving yeah so you know tech give it on the one hand and tech take it away last mile coalition I mean last mile facilities we're being we're drowning. And, and we're complicit too. You know, we order all kinds of crap from Amazon. But the point is, is that the, the fulfillment centers are all in the same handful of communities because the manufacturing zoning only allows certain uses to be in these, like, and these are uh, permitted as warehouses. The warehouses in 1960 from the 61 zoning resolution ain't these warehouses. And that's, so now the South Bronx, Red Hook, Sunset Park, all of a sudden there's, there's been a, a land grab by e-commerce. And now we've got to deal with, you know, literally hundreds of additional... It's like fields. the old garbage wars. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's just a new form of a old, really old problem, environmental racism. And these, yeah, I just was down in Red Hook and it's like a fortress of warehouses all around surrounding the whole peninsula. They actually cast a shadow on the farm and killed the bees, like the Goldman Sachs warehouse cast a new shadow you know i mean obviously it's as of right right they can build whatever they want according to the zoning resolution but they built um an eight a hundred foot high warehouse just across from the red oak farm and yeah cast shadow all winter and killed off the pollinators um and, and it's surrounding it, schools there were a couple it, of schools that yeah fulfillment centers are surrounding yeah 
Yeah, it's really, and then, you know, what is it, like 10,000 trucks a day or something? I do not order anything online, by the way. Like, I think we just have to say no to Amazon. Like, just no. Like, we don't need that. It's destroying small businesses. It's uh, it's kind of eroding the public realm. It's, um, I just don't think we should buy any crap on the internet anymore. Ron, do you want to get a word in edgewise about uh, next actions that this mayor could take? before we, maybe we should open it up to questions after that. I really don't. <laughs> <laughs> Get to work, uh, yeah. <laughs> because I'm not sure what this mayor is capable of doing. Uh, but we, we can't wait again for no, a whole no. administration. No, we can't. I, I, I do think there has to be a recognition of what community-based organizations can do in this whole struggle, and I think that is really a bit important. I'm a bit concerned about changes in land use policies and things of that sort. There is something, though, on the ballot that people I, I may not be aware of, and that is that there are three items that deal with racial equity and, and justice, and most people don't know about those. And I think it's really important uh, that we learn, sit down, and learn a little bit more and from my perspective, vote yes on all three. And it's basically to set up an office of racial equity uh, to be, I don't know how they're gonna pass the Supreme Court test. Why, Ron? Why did you have to do that? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah uh, I don't need the men. Yeah, but well. the, the city will set up an office of racial equity. Uh, they will evaluate all plans. Uh, they have to come up with a racial equity plan every two years the same way we have to come with, up with a water plant. And I think it's a very good uh, initiative and it's one we have to pass and it's one we have to fight for. Uh, and, uh, and, and the other thing is, I, I just think everybody really needs to vote. Uh, vote in New York because it's gonna count too this time. According to Ed, the governorship may be up. You take my yeah. word for it. He's, he's four, four or five points behind. If anybody drives on the Gowanus Expressway heading towards Staten Island, look at the billboard that's up there. Zeldin going after congestion pricing. Like it's, it's, and people who know politics are saying, like, there's a lot of people lately been wondering why is Zeldin spending so much time in New York City? Why isn't he like beating the, the, you know, the, the Republican bastions upstate? And what like political like folks that whose opinion I trust tell me. That's because he's got those areas. He's in order for him to win in New York, he needs at least 30 percent of the vote here in New York City. And that's it's not impossible. I think that could happen. You know, yeah. there's there's a lot of red areas and it's getting worse and people trust government less and less. And he's a climate denier and people people don't like to think about climate change. And yeah, yeah. I do have one hard question to ask my colleagues here, and that is with the gov with the federal government focus on infrastructure, do we face the chance that there will be redlining or uh, in low-income areas or investments in low-income areas that should not be made? So for instance, should we b be building new roadways on, you know, in certain areas where we know they'll be flooded and if we don't do that, will we be accused of redlining those areas? And parts of uh, Edgemere is an area mm -hmm. that I, it comes into play. I mean, we saw a presentation the other day of, uh, of a, an attempt to uh, take a lot of the vacant lots and put them into a land trust, mm -hmm. uh, which will give people the right to control the land in perpetuity, but perpetuity may be until the water comes. Yeah. Right? It was a couple of months from now. And so the issue is, how do we balance that in certain areas where we've had a history of sort of racist planning, where communities have a right to be suspect of, low, of government actions, where to do the right thing may be not to invest in those areas? I mean, th th that's the reason why when we passed the, uh, the state climate law, the, the provision that became Justice 40 at the federal level was so important because it's a clear mandate that you have to actually not just steer your money, your, your 35, 40 percent of clean energy funding to frontline communities. But up until a couple of years ago, NYSERDA wasn't even tracking where the investments went statewide. 
they just and, and and those of us that have been government in government understand that those are decisions that often have less to do with the merits of the infrastructure investment than it is politics, right? So, um, you know, from our perspective, we were like, okay, if we, if we mandate that 35 to 40% go to our communities, if we develop a disadvantaged community framework, which we just finished developing the first one for the state of New York, um, you actually have communities that are not just disadvantaged, you know, based on historical racial uh, inequities or, or income, but, you know, we captured in this metric you know, who, who's, who's got, uh, uh, you know, significant, um, you know, health problems, you know, wh where are the large linguistically op uh, isolated populations, where are the seniors, where, like, these are all vulnerabilities that need to be captured, right? So we've now put that out there. What Governor Zeldin does with that is anybody's mess. Mm -hmm. no, don't, yeah. don't go there. The, the, the issue, though, is uh, one of the things we learned uh, from the Community Reinvestment Act is that money flows into low-income areas. And for many years, that helped to revitalize those areas until those areas got healthy enough that they are now attracting the private sector and individuals. Mm -hmm. But the money is still flowing, but now to displace people in those areas. Mm -hmm. And so maybe one of the things we need to do when it, we're targeting the money into these distressed areas is that the beneficiaries have to be the people who live there, yeah. not just the geography. Yeah. Because if we don't do it that way, if we don't fine tune those rules that way, then we may very well see that really uh, having both a backlash and uh, and actually hurt the people who live there right now. Yeah. I guess one other, I, just um, maybe it's a little bit of a cliche, but one other thing, you know, as the as an educator here, like, w you know, we say you can't, you know, dismantle the master's house with the master's tools, right? Like, I feel like the other thing about not repeating the old mistakes of infrastructure of the past is that we need different leadership. We need more women in charge. We need more people of color in charge. We need to change the composition of our, you know, local governments, our investment banks, or, you know, all the whole way through society. I think that's happening. Uh, not fast enough, though. It seems like it also, Ron's point, connects to your emphasis on affordable option, affordable housing options, so people have some some recourse. There's a place to move to that is safer. Yeah, I think we should just start building housing like crazy right now. Like I feel like we need housing factories. And just start, and we need emergency powers to start just dumping housing into um, single family home districts and other places in the Upper East Side and the Upper West Side. But we have to be careful about that so we don't get emergency houses that build high rise buildings that are lower density than the population that lived there before. Yeah. And that's what we've been doing. We've been using the need for housing to generate the right to go higher and higher, mm -hmm. but not really mandating, again, that we provide the number of units that are necessary to benefit the population. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I wasn't. I, I think not, we're in a housing <laughs> crisis. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're in a perpetual housing crisis now, and we, we need to build our way out. Um, now and, we've been yeah. that way for all the 60 years I've been in this profession. Yeah, yeah. Does anyone have a question for the panelists? David's hand is raised. Right <laughs> Uh, I hesitate because I have a depressing question, which is um, if, as seems increasingly likely, um, the House and the Senate fall to Republican control after November. What do you think will be the consequences for some of the policies that you've been discussing? I couldn't hear the question. If, what if we, what if we lose the House and the Senate? Like, what happens? <laughs> <laughs> Good night, folks. <laughs> um, look, it's it's. One of the things that we learned over the last 10 years is that there are different levels of government where you could get things done. Uh, just, you know, it's a matter of scale, right? Um, you know, uh, even with the even with the loss of, of uh, the House or the Senate, you know, you have uh, billions of dollars that have been approved or at least targeted 
on the IRA, on the, uh, the bi bipartisan infrastructure. So like, there's a ton of money that's on the table. And by the way, like, that's one of the more, I mean, talk about being a cynical optimist. You just gotta love Republican governors railing against socialism and not missing the ribbon cutting photo when the bipartisan infrastructure money starts to flow. These guys are not gonna turn down infrastructure money, right? So, you know, on some level, we've got to count on, on their cravenness and we got to count on the fact that they're going to be, you know, politicians are going to politic, right? And part of it is understanding that um, the rhetoric may not work with them, but, the, you know, the investments and the ability to be able to point to, you know, a piece of infrastructure, that, ne that never gets old for these guys. So I, I, that's what I'm saying. There are ways of moving the agenda forward, even in a Republican-controlled Congress. Uh, we've shown that we could do it at the city and state level. What I've not seen is <laughs> if, we've got, um, if we've got a Republican Congress and a Republican governor and a centrist mayor, I don't know, I, I, I can't remember the last, the last time we had that kind of trifecta, so it's... Mm. I, I, you know, I, I don't have the political experience of the, as these guys, but um, I am from Western Pennsylvania. And um, oh boy, yeah. yeah, and it was like Trump territory. I mean, it's like perpetual Trump territory, but I, I go back there all the time and do workshops on resilience. And, you know, I don't call it the Green New Deal. I call it like the Marshall Plan for the Midwest, but it's all about <laughs> economic development. You want to get back home. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, to visit my parents, but also, <laughs> yeah. No, but no, because I, I, I think that there is a message that, that you know, w that could start to bring, you know, a centrist idea about economic development in, into a, you know, bipartisan agreement. So I, I, maybe we need to, like, suffer through, uh, I guess we suffered so much under the Trump administration. But I do feel like there's a realignment that needs to happen where, where the, the mainstream of the Democratic Party embraces, you know, economic development for, you know, poor rural areas that are left behind. And that could, that could help us win national elections again. Sort of look at it like when the alternatives to incarceration movement started and there were no examples of people with serious crimes being effectively managed in the community. And so no one believed that you could do anything other than in prison. And then yeah. once there were a handful of really good options that had long-term studies showing that they worked and worked better, then the becomes really hard to misspend the money and not invest. And it feels to me like, you know, if you can get a Marshall Plan for the Midwest going in Western PA and someone can get one in Hunts Point and someone can get one in a few other places, you know, then then there is something to advocate for. Yeah. But that works when people believe in facts. Yeah. Well, we need different narratives, you know, like, you know, they, um, you know, people, people believe in stories and we need to tell better stories in these places. And, you know, I feel like the Democratic mainstream has like told one story in Western Pennsylvania for, 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 for my whole life. And they haven't gotten the AOC message in any real way, you know, like, and I think that's a very hopeful message for them. I remember hearing a, a, a survey, I mean, I wish you could remember the, the name of it, but there was a survey years ago where they, um, they, they uh, interviewed a, a, what do you call it, a focus group of, um, of uh, folks in Western, like Trump voters, right? Yeah. And what they did was they, they described a Green New Deal without calling it that. Yeah. And all of the blue collar guys were like, yeah, we want that. Yeah. And, that, and so that, that's what we need to do. Yeah, I, I think that's right. true. And we need a new too. narrative and tell the stories. Yeah. yeah. The I story. think we have time for one more question. Um, there's been a lot of talk about uh, very positive stories out on Staten Island, like the oyster development you were talking about, and there's green belts, and there's the managed retreat that happened after Sandy. Um, I've been following the North Shore, um, and I was wondering if any of you have been thinking about what's going on there. There's, there's more warehouses being built on wetlands. More, just another one was just proposed. It's largely a, an area of people of color in that area and considered an environmental justice community. Uh, they just lost the Graniteville wetlands, um, and uh, 
it seems like there's no traction. Nobody's thinking about it really that much, that you don't see stories about it. It just feels like it's just happening. And the thing is that it's starting to flood out there because they cut down 1,800 trees when they cut down the wetlands, Grantville wetlands. And the communities around there are you know, starting to flood now when, when Hurricane Ida came through last fall. So I'm just kind of wondering if any of you were working out there and what your take is on that, that neighborhood in that area. We have, there's um, um, a group that just actually applied to join NIJA that is a Staten Island, oh God, I'm blanking on the name, but it's, 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 a, a, recently, it's a recent group that is um, uh, doing kind of social justice work on Staten Island and, and they want to get into environmental justice. And over the years, some of us have worked with, um, uh, there have been a couple of groups that, that have organized there. And it's, it's a tough, it's a tough spot i think and part of the problem also is what do people want in the way of an environmental outcome right um there's been a debate in the ej movement for years where some people take the position that it's the manufacturing zoning that's attracting the nuisances and that we have to rezone completely and rezone from manufacturing to residential or commercial to you know, zone out the nuisances, right? But, and there's another part of the EJ movement, and I'm, I'm fully in that uh, square, where, you know, we're, we really see ourselves as industrial retention advocates. And then, in fact, you know, the idea that you have to juxtapose in economic development against environmental protection is, is just a stale, ridiculous concept. And, and I, for the, really, the thing that, that convinced us the most was when North Brooklyn went through its rezoning uh, in the arts, um, I remember the 2000 census for North Brooklyn, uh, I forget which, which exact census tracks, but a, 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 a chunk of North Brooklyn, uh, there was something like 60% was 60 Latino, and that was in 2000. By 2010, that number dropped to 30%. So like literally we lost like half the Latino population in North Brooklyn in a 10 year period during the height of the recession. So like, it wasn't even like there was money flowing, the good times were being had. Like literally the rezoning happened, we got the recession and people were still priced out. And, 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 and so uh, we've long been advocates of, we have to make the industrial sector work better for us. That's why we can bring offshore wind. That's why we can bring you know, solar panels. We can build out. And, and, this, and there, isn't, there isn't often a crisis where you can literally build your way out of it. And that's what we see the industrial mm. sector as that being that opportunity for New York. We could build we could build out the region's adaptation needs, create a ton of jobs, and can only do that in manufacturing sectors or zones. Um, so yeah, th for us, it's it's a challenge between people going for the short term. Uh, a victory of rezoning to residential and then finding themselves getting displaced within a few years uh, or like understanding that this is a long-term fight and some of the long-term solutions, you know, just take the kind of political capital that, that you can't eke out in one even election cycle. So yes, yeah, so some of us are working. And then the thing about Staten Island is it's starting to slowly change, mm -hmm. slowly but surely. Uh, meaning like, they, you know, I've seen more and more progressives because they can't afford to live in Brooklyn. <laughs> so, you know, Staten Island may, may, it may, may be going purple in the next 10 or 15 years. I don't know. <laughs> They're going to do um, it in the next 10 days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Mm. Sorry. Yeah. I feel like that's something the Adams administration could get into is rethinking industrial zoning, you know, with a much finer like performance standards, job standards. And what we should be asking these warehouses to like provide real jobs and like we could change Amazon and make them be union because we have such a big market here. Like, you know, um, we could write it into zoning. Like you can't build a warehouse here unless you're giving people a living wage and you have solar panels on the roof and you have like, you're donating to local schools and you have public art, you know, like whatever, whatever we want, we can ask for, we're not asking. I think your point about it, the warehouse being built in the wetlands is, uh, it, it is unusual. Um, you know, that used to happen quite a bit in Staten Island. Yeah. Um, and I, I would have assumed that that would be part of DEC's overhaul post Sandy of what it will let the planning, yeah. city planning department approve and what. It feels like it's not being regulated. It's not really 
One of the areas I visited in the immediate aftermath of Superstorm Sandy with the group from Hawaii, the National Gazette, was the North Shore of Staten Island. And we eventually had a series of meetings there with Staten Island Community College and a number of others on how to address that issue. Uh, it's very interesting that that's the one area where some money led to some 200 family buildings being uh, bought out. Uh, and it would not have happened if it were not for uh, the leadership and organization that emanated, in that case, from the white community uh, that was very much affected. Which, it was, Isn't it funny how it works out that way? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, it was really, it, the, the person I met, and I don't think he was the leader of this, uh, uh, is, was somebody who had raised his house. He was in the marshland. And yet the water came more than 10 feet and wiped out his house. And uh, he was very much interested in seeing what government could do and how it could be organized and how his needs could be met. He gave me his email, and it was a conservative website. Mm -hmm. He was the leader of one of the... Uh, I forgot what 10 years ago the right wing was called, but... Uh, Republican the Tea Party? The tea, he was a member. It was so so at Tea Party. Tea party. The good old days when they were just a Tea Party and not a white supremacist plan. Well, but plan. but, <laughs> but he, it was the same. <laughs> it was the yeah. same thing that Eddie was talking about before. When you were dealing with the programmatic issues and the issues that were addressing people's needs, then and not the rhetoric or the title, it really went a long way. And I think that community then organized, it was uh, uh, to, for that re displacement. I mean, for that uh, planned migration. The problem is that it been, a lot of those people could not find alternatives and now they're living in other areas that are in jeopardy. Okay, that's one of the findings of, of that move. And the other is that it was only benefiting those who own property. And so we have to find ways of using this money, and there's going to be a bond issue, I think it's on the ballot, yeah. that will, will provide resources uh, for people to be bought out. Uh, and we have to, again, make sure that, that re those resources are there, but the programmatic way it runs has to be done in an effective manner and in an accountable manner and in a, one that is equitable. Yeah. That's I think great. One the, if I can say one, one thing, <laughs> I, I think one, one thing we could take away from uh, all of the positives and, uh, and, and uh, sobering um, roadblocks so far tonight is that uh, some of the stories that you told of success, the Green Industrial District, the, the offshore wind, those things have been years and years in the mm -hmm. making. Absolutely. And they were failures, you know. Yeah until Absolutely. they were successful they were. <laughs> and there's something about you know understanding that this this change is hard and people who will stick with it will get there that i feel is a is a good good thing to take from yeah tonight's that's good thank you for ending on that positive <laughs> note <laughs> and thank you all for being part of this panel eddie ron thad ellen thank you so much for a really wonderful conversation thank you, thank you all for coming